We continue our study of James chapter 2, 14 to 26, by now approaching the passage from a literary perspective. Now, the first thing we have to consider is the question of the text genre. And that's an easy question to answer in this case, because all of the texts looking in this course, by the very nature of the title of the course, are letters. What that means is we're especially attuned to any epistolary devices, that is, the stereotype expressions or conventions that were typical of the genre of letter writing in that day. But we have to also expand that uh, category beyond epistolary to other more broadly literary categories because the biblical writers again were familiar with the rest of the canon with uh, for instance Old Testament text and so some of the literary devices that they know from the writings there also influence their writings in other words the New Testament writers borrow or influence not just from the content of the Old Testament but also its literary devices too so for example we won't be surprised if in our passage we find an inclusio what's an inclusio the repetition of a key word or phrase at the beginning or the end marking the boundary of a literary unit and this is a this isn't an epistolary device it's not limited to letters it's a more broadly literary device and so these are also the things that we hopefully are alert to we're not the sleepy reader right who uh, fails to recognize these things we're the alert reader who looks carefully not just at what the biblical writers say but also how they say it now part of a literary uh, analysis is making sure we begin at the right spot in a passage and also end at the right spot and right off the bat we have to recognize that we're beginning somewhat artificially in the middle of a passage or to say it differently um, even though we're starting at 214 we need to recognize that our passage actually begins in chapter 2 verse 1 this is a bit unusual because James as a whole is made up of shorter units. In fact, it's been quite frustrating for a number of biblical commentators to understand the macro structure of the letter of James. But chapter 2 is somewhat out of character then with the rest of the letter in the sense that here we have a long extended treatment on the very same subject. If I were preaching on James uh, 2, 14 to 26, I might say, for instance, at the beginning of the reading of the text. So before the sermon, before the reading of the text, I might say, even though our passage today is chapter 2, 14 to 26, it's important for you to recognize that James has actually started talking about faith earlier, already at the opening of chapter 2. And so perhaps later today, after this worship service, or later on this week, you might want to read the rest of the chapter so that you can hear today's scripture passage in its larger context. And so that would be a way in a, a quick fashion, in a worship context, or even in a class, you might draw your reader's attention to the fact that our passage is part of a larger unit. Now in order to show that there is a link between the second half of chapter 2, 2, 14 to 26, and the first half of chapter 2, 2, 1 to 13, you can see here all of these seven or so links between the two sections. And I have a couple of commentators who also highlight the fact that our passage needs to be understood in light of the preceding passage. First, we have a quote from Ralph Martin, a retired professor from Fuller Theological Seminary. He says, quote, We still have to consider how 2.14-26 to 26 fits into the preceding section. The links between these two paragraphs are too strong to be overlooked. These parallels argue for a smooth and connected flow in the author's writing, and the same situation lies in the background of the two units. So this quote affirms the point that I've been making, namely that 2.14 to 26 does have some close ties, some close links with the preceding passage. And Martin also says that the same historical situation lies behind both passages. So later on, in a separate section, when we look at this passage historically, then we're going to draw some information from the preceding passage, which will shed light on our passage. Yet another quote from Luke Timothy Johnson, he says, quote, 
The position taken here is that in chapter 2, James develops a single argument. In this sense, the final part of the discussion in 2.14 to 26 only provides the broadest formal framework for the specifics argued in chapter 2, 1 to 13. Likewise, the point of the discussion in 2.14 to 26 is not to be found by way of engagement with a Pauline position, but rather by the specific points argued in 2.1 to 13. A couple of important uh, things about this quote. One, you can see again a scholar who rightly recognizes the links between our passage, 2.14 to 26, and the earlier passage, 2.1 to 13. But he also draws out, I think, the consequence of linking these two. One, he argues that uh, 2.14 to 26 is somewhat broad and general, and you need to understand our passage, the broad and general half, in light of the earlier, more specific situation. That goes back to the quote of uh, Ralph Martin a minute ago, where he says that the same historical context or situation lies behind both passages. And then the third thing about this quote that is good and helpful is he, he highlights what ought not to be done, which is the very thing that is way too often done. In other words, uh, New Testament folks come along and they take 2.14 to 26 and they sort of say rip it out of its context. In other words, they fail to see how it's linked with the passage beforehand. And then they compare it not to the passage beforehand with which it belongs, but they rip it out of context and compare it to Paul. And then, of course, they draw that conclusion, which we've highlighted in the introduction, supposedly, that James and Paul are at odds with each other, that they contradict each other. And so we can see that by recognizing the links between the second half of chapter 2 with the first half of chapter 2 in James, that uh, that provides an important corrective uh, for interpreting our passage. Well, um, once we have, all, well, one other point we have to make sure we don't forget that other saying uh, of Wyma's that uh, goes like this, that, that form supplements but does not supplant content. Form supplements but does not supplant content. So another reason we know for uh, there being a shift at 214, now again we have to backtrack maybe a little bit here, or maybe I have to anticipate a possible confusion. So I first started highlighting the link between the two halves of chapter 2, and now I'm saying even though they're linked together, nevertheless there is a shift at verse 14. So I'm somewhat justified in starting with a new break in chapter 214, even though I'm fully aware of the fact that 214 to 26 is also at the same time linked with the passage that comes beforehand. So here are my evidences or clues for the shift, if you will, uh, for starting a new section at 2.14. Uh, and the first literary evidence, this is actually epistolary, is the vocative, my brothers. We've seen lots of examples of how the vocative marks a shift either to a major or a minor topic in Paul's letters. And this is a wide phenomena in other biblical writers too, and so we're not surprised to meet it in James. The other clue that verse 14 begins something new is that we have an example of a syndeton. A syndeton is just a fancy word for saying that there's no little Greek particle or word showing the connection between verse 14 with the preceding verse. And if there's no word like that, and you can see some examples of those connective words that biblical writers typically use, like gar, de, Allah, or kai, that suggests that therefore there isn't a link, or at least not a strong link in our case, between 14 and verse 13, and therefore we're beginning something new. The other evidence that we have for beginning something new is that use of a word pair. So the word faith is found earlier in chapter 2, 1 to 13, and it's found in our passage, uh, 2, 14 to 26. But there's a difference between faith and the two halves of chapter 2. In the second half, we get the word pair faith with deeds or works. Uh, you'll probably understand what a word pair is. If I say hi, you say low. If I say heaven, you might say earth. And in this passage, if I say faith, you say works or deeds. And this word pair occurs ten times. That's an awfully high frequency within a short amount of verses. 
And we've talked before in this course about how a keyword is repeated and it acts like glue holding a section of the passage together. And that doesn't sound very scholarly, so we have a more impressive academic way of referring to this. We talk about a keyword, or in this specific example, a keyword pair giving lexical coherence to a passage. Coherence means that it holds together, and lexical means that it holds together on the basis of a lexical term, that is a specific word, or in this particular insta inst instance, two words, the word pair, faith, and works. So faith occurs in the preceding passage, but not the word pair, faith, and works. And afterwards, in three following, neither one occurs. And so that's yet further clue, further literary clue, that 2, 14 to 26 belongs together as an independent unit, as a literary thought. Now the end of the passage, uh, that's not so debatable. All commentators recognize that there are all kinds of clues that our passage ends at 226. We know that because in, uh, well, we have the end of the word pair of faith and works that we've just talked about. In 3.1, we have yet another vocative indicating a shift to a new topic. Also, uh, that saying that I mentioned earlier and didn't finish, form supplements but doesn't supplant content. So we look not just at the formal features of a text, but we also look at its content. And when we do that, we see that there is quite a shift in content in chapter 3. We lose the discussion on faith, and more specifically faith versus works, or faith and works, and now suddenly we get the business of the tongue. And so all of that pulled together, we have compelling evidence that the unit ends at 226. Or to say it differently, we have a fixed unit, 214 to 26, even though there are connections with the preceding part of the chapter, nevertheless it can function uh, as an independent unit. Well, now that we have the boundaries of our passage, we know where it begins and we know where it ends, what do we do next? Well, we've said before in our course together that we could do something that's good but not great. In other words, we could just simply begin and then in a verse-by-verse -verse fashion go through the text. I call this army exegesis because we're marching through the text verse-by-verse, verse. Uh, a more uh, technical expression or positive expression would be we call this expository preaching typically if you're talking about a preaching context where you go through a passage verse by verse and as I've already said it's a good thing it's a good thing because you're sticking to the text you're not reading the text and then fleeing from the text by telling stories or only highlighting application without first dealing seriously with the then and there of the biblical text so a verse by verse study of a passage is indeed a good thing but it's not a great thing it's not a great thing because you might lose the forest for the trees or in this case you might miss the macro structure the logic of the biblical writer because you're so focused in the individual verses and maybe all the different words in all of those individual verses and this is where as a literary approach we recognize that James just like Paul is a skilled letter writer and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit thinks carefully not just about what is going to be said but how that is going to be structured. In other words, James doesn't just kind of get up on the pulpit, look at his watch and start talking for a while and then looks at his watch and says, okay, time's up. No, he has an idea ahead of time of what he's going to say and the package, the structure in which this uh, message or sermon is going to be found. Or to use an analogy, I've used this before, the idea of a map quest, right? How does James get from the start of the passage, 14, uh, that's, yeah, verse 14, uh, to uh, 26? Now when you do ask those questions, and uh, others do too, right? as long as you surround yourself with a good cloud of witnesses, you can have help in this process, it's, it's relatively easy to see that the first half of the passage has some negative examples, whereas the second half of the passage seems to have some positive examples. 
We saw that already under our grammatical analysis. Remember the opening question was introduced expecting the answer no. And so the first half of the passage seems to be something bad, especially also that rhetorical question, t ta ophelos, right? What is the benefit or what is the use? And we saw that the answer to that is always again nothing, not a squad. So the first half seems to, to be, so to say, negative or bad, whereas the second half, also introduced with questions, but this time expecting the answer yes. Was Abraham justified when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? And the answer in Greek is yes. And, and what about Rahab? Was she justified when she helped out the spies? And the answer is yes. And so my first reaction when I looked at the passage is it seems to fall into these two halves, something negative and something positive. I started looking at the passage a little more closely and I noticed some other technical details which tended to support that division. And let me also explain something else that I noticed what James was doing. Too many, pas too many uh, uh, pastors and I think theologians approach this passage from the word pair of faith versus works faith against works. And they see that as the contrast which James is working on in this passage. However, I think that James is working on a contrast, but a different one in this passage. James isn't contrasting faith versus works. He's contrasting faith versus faith. Or more accurately, one kind of faith against another kind of faith. The one kind of faith is described in the first half of the passage, and that's a non-saving faith. Remember the opening question, can such faith, right, the faith I just described in verse 14 where somebody says they have faith but no works, can that kind of faith save? And the answer is no, right? T tall fellows, it has no benefit or gain. So the first half of the passage contrasts a workless, non-saving faith. And then the second half of the passage also talks about faith, but this is a different one. This is indeed a saving, or if you want, a justifying faith, a faith that naturally manifests itself with works. So part of the problem that many people get into in this passage is the contrast they see is between faith and works, when instead it's a contrast between one kind of faith and another kind of faith. And so I've entitled the first half, the negative half that I talked about a few moments ago, as the non-saving faith. And it opens with a vocative, just like the second half, which does describe a saving faith, uh, opens. It also opens with a vocative. Then in the negative half, we have not one, but two examples. The first example is the most important. It most closely connects with the specific historical situation. We're going to get there in a few moments when we take off our literary hat and uh, approach the passage from a historical context. But we're going to see that uh, the first example of a non-saving faith is a person who's all talk and no action, right? A person who sees somebody in need and then just utters a pious cliché. But there's also a second uh, negative example, and that is the demons and their faith, because they apparently have some kind of faith, at least the kind of faith that acknowledges that God exists and is one, but that too isn't a uh, saving or a uh, positive faith. And then uh, the boundaries of that first example is marked by another nice uh, literary device, and that's an inclusio. The T to Ophelos, which begins, is then marked at the end by T to Ophelos, a second time, followed by the application. And so there's a nice tight literary structure to the first half of the passage. And then we move to the second half, and again, it, like the first, opens with evocative, this time not my brothers, but oh foolish man or oh foolish person. And then there's another clue about the start of the second half. There's a disclosure formula. James says, do you want to know? And hopefully the bells start ringing in your mind and you say, aha, that's a disclosure formula commonly used by, by writers in that day to mark a shift to a new topic or to a new section. And here we have the two positive examples, and both of them come from the Old Testament. You say, of course they do. 
because you know from your historical reading, right, that James is likely the brother of Jesus, and he's pastor of the churches in uh, Judea and the surrounding area. In other words, he's writing to a Jewish audience, and so not surprisingly, James, you know, uses examples that his audience not only knows, but would find powerful and authoritative. And both of these examples, in contrast to the two examples in the first half of the passage, these examples are both positive, both introduced in a Greek expression that clearly expect the answer yes. The example of Abraham and his faith when he offered up his son Isaac, or more accurately, not just that, but his works, plural, imperfect tense were working together with his deeds to pick up something we observed under our grammatical analysis and then also the positive example of the faith of Rahab. And then this long discussion comes to a close with a nice simile. Right? Simile is just as this is the case so also that is the case. And so just as the body and the spirit, if you pull them apart, is dead, so also if you pull faith and works apart, it's dead. In other words, you can't separate the body and the spirit. They belong together naturally, automatically, necessarily. And the same thing is true for faith and works. You can't pull the two apart. A true faith, a saving faith, is by definition a working faith, right? A faith that manifests itself in acts, in deeds, not only of kindness to those who are hurting and in need, but also in acts of obedience to God and His will. I've simplified this outline a little bit in this next slide for you. And so here again, you can see how there's the negative half of what faith isn't, or what a non-saving faith looks like. And then you have the positive uh, half of what true faith is, or what a saving faith looks like. Both have an opening question, which address their thesis, and both halves have examples. Two negative examples in the first half, and two positive examples in the second half, concluded by this natural or powerful simile. Well, at this point, I'm always happy in my exegesis, because now I've got a road map. A road map that for sure I'm going to use in my exegesis. Right now I just need to sit down and, and to sort of say put flesh on this exegetical outline. Now the preacher in me also likes to use this exegetical outline as much as I can also for my sermon outline. Because if my sermon outline comes from the text and I follow that sermon outline, it will always do something important. If my sermon outline comes from the text and I follow it, it will always drive me back to the text. And uh, when I preach the text, I know that good things will happen, right? It's only when I don't preach the text. It's only when I get caught up telling stories, trying to be clever, you know, just trying to meet people's needs to be relevant. Yes, I want to do those things too, but they can't come at the expense of a careful reading and hearing of the text. And so now we uh, finish this other approach, this uh, important approach to uh, any biblical text, and that's approaching it literarily. And so when we come back, we'll uh, pick up yet another hermeneutical approach and we'll approach our passage from an historical perspective. See you in a minute.